The Rambam, in Hilchas Tshuva, makes a very valid point. He says you can do Tshuva at any time of the year, but, and this is a very important but, Yom Kippur is the one day of the year that has been set aside for Tshuva. And therefore, Yom Kippur is the day when you should really focus on recalibrating your relationship with God. Although, for us, it's actually not quite so black and white. For us, Yom Kippur has become the pinnacle, the highlight of a period of time that we call Yomim Noraim, which is usually translated into English as Days of Awe. But I much prefer translating it as Awesome Days. You see, what we have done is take Yom Kippur and we've expanded it in both directions. We already start anticipating Yom Kippur at the beginning of Elul. In the Sephardic tradition, that's when they begin to say Selichot, penitential prayers, that are said either late at night or very early in the morning. In the Ashkenazi tradition, we also say Selichot, but we begin saying them in the week before Rosh Hashanah. Then we have Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah itself, which has evolved into a time of intense prayer. And we hear the shofar, and we engage seriously with ourselves and with our future. Then we have a Yimei Teshuvah, the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, a countdown to Yom Kippur. And then there is Yom Kippur itself. But even when Yom Kippur is done, it's still not quite over. We have a kind of mini Yom Kippur. It's a Yom Kippur service on Hashanah Rabbah. And then, that's it. Yom Noraim is an intense period with Yom Kippur at the center, but during the rest of the year, if we give any thought to Teshuvah at all, it's totally marginal. The question that hovers over this whole idea is this. What is the point of concentrating all of this intensity into one day, or even into one month? Why is there a build-up of an entire year before we get to Yom Kippur? It's not as if our sins only happen around Yom Kippur. So why store up all the Teshuvah action until Elul and Tishri? Is there something that we're missing about the point of Yomim Noroim that we should be focusing on so that we get it right? To illustrate the answer, I'm going to use one of the parables of the Dublin Magid. Do you know who the Dublin Magid was? He was an 18th century rabbi who specialized in using colorful stories to illustrate answers that he wanted to give to questions that arise from passages in the Torah or from random aspects of Jewish life that are puzzling us. The Dublin Magid was a master orator and a brilliant storyteller. And wherever he went, people flocked to hear him, not just ordinary folk, but rabbis and scholars as well. The Vilna Gaon, the Gra, got a real kick out of listening to him, and he considered the Dubna Magid to be a brilliant man who could turn the densest material into something that anyone could understand. So here's a story from the Dubna Magid. There was once a king who had a trusted advisor who he truly loved. This advisor served the king for many, many years, and over time, as he became more successful, and the king favoured him more and more, other people at the royal court became jealous, and eventually they slandered him to the king. The, be the king became very suspicious of his beloved advisor, and he ordered for him to be arrested and thrown into a deep dungeon cell in the basement of the prison. That night, in the middle of the night, the guards arrived at the advisor's house and pulled him out of bed, and he was unceremoniously transported to the prison and thrown into the dungeon. The advisor was completely beside himself. What have I done wrong? He asked the guards. I've done nothing wrong. Why am I being arrested? But the guards just shrugged their shoulders. They didn't know the answer. They were only following the king's orders. Exhausted by his arrest and shaken by his situation, the advisor lay down and eventually he fell asleep. His body clock woke him up a few hours later, but he'd gone into some kind of psychiatric crisis. He completely blanked out on what had happened to him. It was pitch black in the cell, so he thought it must still be nighttime. So he closed his eyes and he went back to sleep. 
After a couple more hours, he woke up again, but it was still dark. So he went back to sleep. He was a bit surprised that the night wasn't over, but he went back to sleep anyway. Eventually, he couldn't sleep anymore. He lay in his bed, eyes open, wondering why it wasn't morning yet. Meanwhile, the king was also wondering what had happened to his friend. He went to the prison and asked to see him. He stood next to the cell door and he heard his friend crying to himself, how long is this terrible night? When is it going to be day so that I can get out of my bed? You fool, the king shouted through the door. You think that you're still in your comfortable mansion and this night is never ending? Don't you realize the sun is up? It's the middle of the day. In fact, it's almost night again. But you can't see it because you're in a dungeon. All you need to do is call out to me and I will hear you and you will see light again. Do you know what? The Jewish people are that advisor to the king. We get mired in darkness as the months go by and we don't even know that it should be light. We lie in our beds and we wait for the darkness to disappear. But it doesn't and we don't know what to do. And so each year we have the king knocking on the door of the dungeon cell. Hello, I'm here. It's light outside. All you need to do is to get out of your bed and come out, call out to me, and I'll take you into the light. As the Rambam says, quoting the Posset from Yeshaya, Dear Shu Hashem Behimatzai, call out to God when he is available, when he's around. Of course, you could do tshuva all year round. But as the year goes on, you end up lying in bed, waiting for the light, and you don't get up. That's human nature. We go into denial. We rationalize. We explain away the darkness to such an extent that our ability to connect with the divine completely disappears. But we are God's favored people. He wants us to be close to him. He wants us to be out in the light. He believes in our goodness. So he comes to the door and he tells us, all you need to do is call out to me. The light is just outside the door. The thing is, when you're in pitch black darkness and suddenly a light goes on and shines very brightly, it can be so blinding that you can't see anything. So we begin preparing for God's visit a few weeks in advance. That's what we're doing when we say slichas. We're still lying in our bed, not yet ready for the light, not even really aware that the light is out there. But we are getting ready for Yom Kippur, when God's going to be at the cell door, ready to let us out. All we need to do is call out to him. Slichus is tiny slivers of light. Rosh Hashanah is a bit more light and also includes an alarm clock that we call the shofar. Then we have a Yimei Teshuva. The light is beginning to seep through. And finally, we have Yom Kippur and it's daytime again. We can get out of bed and everything is back to what it should be. Oh, and of course, we can't let that light go, even when Yom Kippur is over. That's why we keep it going for as long as we can, until Hashanah Rabbah, before we fall back into that familiar pattern once again. And then the cycle repeats itself. Let me take this opportunity of wishing you a year that only has light and no darkness. May the light of Yom Kippur that we begin turning on when we start saying slichus remain bright and shining for you and for all of us throughout the coming year. Tichle shona v'kileloi seho, tachel shona uvirchei seho. May the year end, and with it, its curses. May the new year begin, and with it, its blessings. May we all have a ksiba v'chsima toiva, a beautiful year ahead of only bracha, hatzlocha, health, joy, and simchas ad belidai. Thank you.